Chapter 40 is looking at the return of conservatism in the United States starting with the 1980 election up and through 1992. Now, to begin with, um, Jimmy Carter, who we know was elected in 1976 uh, on the basis of he was a Washington outsider, he's gone pretty much with the 1980 election. Uh, that Iran hostage situation was a uh, killer for him. Um, also, the economic crisis of the late 1970s was a huge uh, falling out point for Jimmy Carter. So adding to that, the fact that he was facing primary opposition from within his own party, from Ted Kennedy, uh, pretty much showed that Jimmy Carter was dead as a doornail for the 1980 election. Uh, entering for the Republicans is the conservative sweetheart of the modern day, Ronald Reagan. Uh, Ronald Reagan is going to be the leader of the new right. Uh, pretty much this is a return to a conservative government uh, against the activist governments of the past kind of that anti-big government stance. Uh, and so part of the new right, uh, as opposed to that new left of that, those hippie anti-war protesters of the Vietnam War era, uh, the new right is pretty much made up of evangelicals. The moral majority is a primary issue. Uh, they're concerned with less government involvement, you know, or as uh, Ronald Reagan said, government is not the solution to our problems. Government is the problems. Um, and focusing on scaling back uh, the role of government in our daily lives. That is everywhere except when it comes to defense spending, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, back to the moral majority, though. They're very concerned with social issues, abortion, prayer in school, gay and lesbian rights, things like this. Uh, and a return to a focus on Christianity uh, is a primary part of the new right. Now, Reagan's advisors during his time in office are known as the neoconservatives, his group of the best and the brightest, so to speak. Their focus is on a free market economy, uh, traditional American values, and very, very strong against the Soviet Union. Uh, and so in 1980, uh, Ronald Reagan won in a landslide victory, 489 electoral votes to 49 for Jimmy Carter. Here you see the electoral map. Uh, here's the new president, Ronald Reagan. So what his first term in office is going to look like. Um, one major victory for Ronald Reagan, and he really didn't have to do a whole lot for it, but he gets credit for the release of the Iranian hostages on his inauguration day after 444 days being held. Uh, the Iranian government, this is kind of a big middle finger to Jimmy Carter's presidency. Um, Jimmy Carter had been working tirelessly to try to get the Iranian hostages uh, released so that he could get some other credit, but they released them just after uh, Jimmy Carter left office. And like I said, uh, he is going to be all about conservative values, less government involved in our country. And that's very much uh, prevalent from what we saw happen in California. Uh, Reagan had been governor of California previously. Uh, Proposition 13, as an example, in 1978, had cut California's property taxes pretty much to the bone. We're going to see the same thing, or at least attempting to do the same thing, uh, in the United or on a, a larger scale. So it's showing the shift of the country. We're moving away from that large government welfare state mentality that we've seen going on pretty much since the New Deal with FDR and a more of a focus on um, less government in our daily lives. Now, uh, one major way that uh, uh, Ronald Reagan was able to get many of his programs passed was with the help of conservative Democrats or bull weevils as they were called. Um, he needed their help in order to get income taxes and estate taxes cut. So these are technically Democrats, but they tended to vote along Reagan's party line for the majority of the time. Now, much like other conservatives that we've seen in the past, from the days of Alexander Hamilton onward, uh, a primary focus for Ronald Reagan is cutting the budget or supply-side economics, trickle-down theory, Reaganomics, all of these terms mean the same thing. They're just calling them different things. Uh, tax breaks to people in society. That prosperity then trickles down to the lower classes because uh, uh, the wealthy create jobs, they promote business interests, uh, and prosperity trickles down. Um, so this is in direct opposition to Keynesian economics or that demand-side economics that we've talked about with Democrats in the past. Um, however, even 
even though he is going to be cutting uh, taxes, 25% approximately, uh, he was still blamed for the 1981-1982 recession, where there was an 11% unemployment and some business and bank failures. But even though we talk about Ronald Reagan as this staunch conservative and less government and cutting taxes, etc., that's all fine and good. He does that on the social side or the domestic side, but when it comes to our arms rates with the USSR, he actually steps it up a notch. Uh, he continues on with deficit spending because the Cold War is still going on. $2 trillion spent during his time in office uh, in that arms race. Uh, we're averaging about $200 billion annually in deficit deficits, meaning spending more than we're actually bringing in. Uh, here you see those Iranian hostages, and they're released back to the United States. Uh, this is a political cartoon showing that everyone in Washington has gone to the right, meaning uh, conservative as opposed to left wing. So speaking of that arms race with the Soviet Union, um, Ronald Reagan is really uh, an of the old school mind of containment. He really honestly believed that the Soviet Union was the focus of evil in the modern world. He called them the evil empire. And so Ronald Reagan says, we can't lose against these guys. Uh, we have to build up our arms. And this is actually part of why the Soviet Union did end up collapsing, because they just couldn't keep up buying up all these massive weapons. But we'll talk about that later. Uh, one plan that he did promote that never actually went through was the Strategic Defense and initiative. SDI, also known as Star Wars by its opponents. This was proposed in 1983. Uh, Reagan had actually asked uh, American scientists to develop basically a defense shield, for lack of a better term, for to deflect any uh, enemy missiles. That should the Soviet Union launch an ICBM at the United States, the SDI would be able to uh, um, figure it out and launch its own missile to deflect it, to destroy it, etc. But it was estimated to cost about trillions of dollars, so it really never went through in total. But this does spur the Soviets to try to keep up massive spending on their side. Um, other than trying to keep up with the uh, United States, the Soviet Union is facing problems within their Eastern Bloc countries, within those satellite nations. Uh, specifically, one example is in Poland. A workers' movement known as Solidarity was pushing for more reforms, uh, trying to open Poland up. But at this time, they, uh, the Soviet Union responded by clamping down and issuing martial law in uh, Poland. But this is showing that even the Eastern European countries are demanding a change. They don't want to remain in this communist government anymore. Um, other issues around the world, and this is going to be the start of what will become the Iran-Contra situation, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But in 1979, uh, the long-backed government in Nicaragua was overcome by a communist group known as the Sandinistas. Um, Ronald Reagan sees this as a Soviet puppy, puppet government. Uh, he was worried about uh, uh, seeing this being exported to other countries, or similarly what we've already talked about, a domino theory, that if we allow Nicaragua to fall to communism, possibly other Latin American countries might do the same. And so Ronald Reagan uh, starts to fund the anti-communist guerrillas within Nicaragua known as the Contras. These are not Democrats. These are anti-communists trying to give them uh, money and aid and weapons in order to overthrow the Sandinista government, which is the communist government. Um, however, in 1983, the Democrats are back in power in Congress. Um, they look further into the funding of these uh, Contra guerrillas down in Nicaragua and realize that a lot of that has been done without congressional approval. Uh, and so Congress responds by slapping Reagan on the list by passing the Boland Amendment, uh, banning any military aid to the Contras for two years. And that's going to be important in a minute. So. I mentioned his first term versus his second term. His first term really is about shrinking the size and scope of the U.S. Uh, government. 
And really, his second term is going to be all about foreign policy, specifically aimed at the Soviet Union, uh, Iran, Nicaragua, etc. In 1985, in uh, the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev becomes the new leader of the party. He is a different type of communist um, in the Soviet Union than what we've seen before. He's younger. He's a more moderate communist. He's not that old guard communist. He's more reform-minded. Uh, and so Mikhail Gorbachev sees the state of his country and promotes two major reforms within the Soviet Union. The first is glasnost. It means openness, allowing citizens within the USSR to discuss social and economic problems, to try to find solutions to the problems that they have without fear of retribution. And so as a result of this, um, uh, real journalism was allowed, uh, opponents were released from jail, churches opened, uh, etc. It's promoting an openness, a dialogue within the Soviet Union. Another reform that Mikhail Gorbachev promotes is known as perestroika. Uh, this is to reform the economic system. Now, communism in general is focused on a central planning scheme where the government sets the prices, they set the uh, production levels, the wages, etc. Perestroika uh, is seeking to reform some of this, to not completely move to an open system, or I'm sorry, to a uh, capitalist system, but to allow for some small businesses to form, to have a mixture almost of some central planning where the government controls it and then some small businesses where private individuals control business. Um, he's also calling for more democratization. This is very much opening up the system, but this is going to create some problems among those old guard conservative, or I'm sorry, among those old guard communists within the Soviet Union. We'll see that late, later on. But with this reform-minded communist, um, uh, Ronald Reagan has uh, somebody to bounce ideas off of, work with, etc. And so the two of them, we do see an easing of relations between the two countries when Mikhail Gorbachev becomes its leader. Uh, for example, December 1987, they signed the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty uh, to limit certain uh, uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, here you see the two signing the I, uh, uh, IRNF Treaty. Now, back to the Iran-Contra scandal. So I told you before, the United States had been funding anti-communist guerrilla warriors down in Nicaragua. Reagan was stopped from doing that uh, in 1983. In a completely separate issue, in 1983, also marked more Americans being taken hostage in Lebanon. Lebanese terrorists who were loyal to the new Muslim country of Iran took Americans hostage in its capital city of Beirut. We obviously want to get our citizens back. And so the United States goes to Iran, who these Lebanese terrorists are loyal to, and basically strikes a deal with them. This is called the Arms for Hostages deal. Uh, and this is a secret deal where the United States would sell Iran uh, anti-tank missiles, other weapons, uh, etc., in exchange for number one cash, obviously they're going to pay us for that, but also in exchange for them helping us to get our hostages released from Lebanon. We then took that money that we made off of this arms for hostages deal and gave that money secretly to the Contras in Nicaragua. All of this is being done without congressional approval. Uh, it is being brokered by Lieutenant Oliver North, who is going to get in a whole lot of trouble for this. So what we see here is several moving parts. This is an Iran-Contra scandal. We uh, sell Iran guns and weapons and whatnot that they use in their war against Iraq. We then take that money in order to spend it or to give it to the Contras in Nicaragua, who we are not supposed to be giving money for, to. We completely bypassed the Boland Amendment. We bypassed Congress. All this is being done secretly by the CIA and Oliver North. Now, in subsequent uh, congressional hearings, it was very unclear what role Ronald Reagan or his vice president, George H.W. Bush, played. Uh, and minor people were sent to prison. They were later pardoned uh, by Bush in 1992. But it is a scandal because, once again, as we've seen in the era of LBJ and Nixon, the government is um, moving beyond its scope. Uh, here you see some of the major uh, areas of focus in the 1980s in the Middle East. Once again, down here in uh, Latin and South America as well. Uh, these are those Contra rebels that we were secretly aiding. 
Now let's take a look at the conservative court that is going to be created under Ronald Reagan. Um, as we've talked about before, um, Ronald Reagan is focusing on downgrading uh, that liberalism that we've seen in the past, especially the liberal, liberal activism on the part of the Supreme Court. Remember, the Warren Court, as a primary example, uh, had promoted all this change from its rulings on the bench. Uh, Reagan's appointees are going to move away from that. Uh, during his time in office, he was able to appoint uh, three justices to the Supreme Court, including the Chief Justice uh, William Rehnquist. He was uh, uh, advanced to the, uh, the most elevated level, the uh, uh, Chief Justice, the Rehnquist Court. Um, he also appointed the first uh, female on the, on the bench was Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, so he is trying to change the shape of the Supreme Court. Um, and before he's all said and done, not just on the Supreme Court, but on all federal courts, because remember the President has the right to appoint federal judges with the consent of the Senate, he was able to appoint half of all federal judges, turning the courts towards conservatism a more strict interpretation of the Constitution. Uh, and so because of this, we start to see a scaling back on affirmative action. We start to see a scaling back on abortion rights. For example, Webster versus Reproductive Health Services in 1989 and Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1982, that abortion is not an absolute right, um, that there are some restrictions that can be made. And so this very much appeals to the new right, especially the moral majority. Uh, here you see this is Jerry Falwell, the leader of the moral majority. Uh, and justice is a lady. This is um, marking the day that Sandra Day O'Connor became an appointee on the Supreme Court. All right, so let's move beyond Ronald Reagan. He served two terms in office. Uh, his successor is going to be his VP, George H.W. Bush, who is, to some degree is going to continue on with the Reagan administration. He resoundingly beat Michael Dukakis, uh, governor of Massachusetts, in 1988. Um, and under George H.W. Bush, he is going to see a lot of issues rising up internationally speaking. For example, in the spring of 1988, we see pro-democracy protests break out in Tiananmen Square, which is right in the middle of Beijing in China. Uh, they, these are uh, students from China demanding more democracy. Um, instead of abiding by this or instead of talking to these Chinese students, um, the Chinese government threw out all foreign media uh, and then rolled the tanks in the military and to crush this opposition, to crush these pro-democracy um, protesters. Um, and while this was happening, because China is such a large trading partner with us, even though George H.W. Bush is demanding for their rights, we did not break off relations with the Chinese government. Uh, elsewhere, issues are rising up in Eastern Europe. Um, in 1989, that workers' movement that I've mentioned before, that solidarity movement, uh, helps to topple Poland's uh, communist government. They were quickly followed by a fall in Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania, and now East Germany. By December of 1989, there are so many people within Germany demanding for democratization of East Germany, uh, that the East German government can't maintain it any longer. And so in December of 1989, very symbolically, the Berlin Wall that had gone up to keep East Germans in uh, is broken down. There's no way that East Germany can maintain its separate government with this much talk of democratization and the fall of the Berlin Wall. And by 1990, the two Germanys were finally reunited. The writing is on the wall. It's only a matter of time before the same thing is going to happen to the Soviet Union. Uh, here is the pre new president, George H.W. Bush. Uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, very symbolic of the fall of communism. Uh, and these are tanks rolling into Tiananmen Square. Okay, so all of Eastern Europe is essentially falling away from communism. You know, it's a f collapse of the satellite nations. It's only a matter of time, like I said, that the same thing is going to happen in the Soviet Union. Um, that openness, that glasnost has started to mean that people are demanding for more democracy. So those old guard communists looking to hang on to control attempted a coup d'etat against um, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. Um, however, though, the one thing that is helping Gorbachev during this attempt
attempted coup d'etat by these hardline old guard communists was the fact that the Russian president, Boris Yeltsin, was very much in favor of keeping Gorbachev in power. Remember, the Soviet Union is 16 in, uh, different republics, Russia just being the largest of them. And so Gorbachev remains in power, but he realizes that his country is dying from within. Um, he does resign his position in December of 1991, and with that, essentially, the USSR dissolves without a shot being fired between the two countries. This is the end of the Cold War, a quiet end to the Cold War in 1991. In its place, we see these 16 republics uh, becoming their own independent countries with a loose affiliation, the Commonwealth of Independent States, the CIS, that loose affiliation, like I said, of the former Soviet republics. And they are attempting to some degree free market economics, uh, democracy to some degree. But Issues are naturally going to rise up from the former Soviet Union and those old satellite nations, especially among ethnic groups seeking self-determination. For example, and this is still an issue going on today, in Chechnya, which is right on the Caspian Sea where there is a lot of oil, uh, Chechen rebels tried to gain independence uh, from Russia in 91. They were crushed. Uh, ethnic cleansing in Yugoslavia and inevitably civil war on that side of uh, Europe. And so this is creating massive refugee problems uh, in Eastern Europe, flooding into West Germany. Uh, here, like I said, this is the collapse of Vladimir Lenin's um, statue, obviously the end of communism. Uh, and here you see where some of the problems and some of the changes are going on in uh, the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. So let's talk about the Persian Gulf War, a very, very short war. Back in the 1980s, there had been a war between Iran and Iraq. I'd referenced this before. We pretty much funded the Iranians during this time. Uh, this had created, though, a massive war debt for Iraq that they had to somehow pay off. The leader of Iraq at this time was named Saddam Hussein. And so in August of 1990, Iraq invaded the very, very tiny country of Kuwait. Kuwait, while it is super tiny, tiny uh, is nothing but oil essentially so they're looking to be able to pay off their war debt by seizing control of Kuwaiti oil uh, after they looted Kuwait the Iraqi soldiers began moving towards another country Saudi Arabia if they were successful capturing both Kuwait and Saudi Arabia uh, Iraq would have controlled half of the world's oil supply. The United Nations said that this is an aggressive move. They ordered Iraq out and tried to implement economic sanctions. They were given a deadline till January 15th of 1991, or the UN would use force to get them out of there. This UN action, which is primarily led by the United States, um, the U.S. had 539,000 troops uh, versus 270,000 from other countries, go in to push Iraq out. So they basically can't take control of half the world's oil supply. Um, this starts in January of 1991 uh, with a 37-day bombing raid um, on Iraq and occupied Kuwait. This is Operation Desert Storm to soften them up before the coming invasion. Uh, in response to this, though, Saddam Hussein launched short-range Scud missiles at Saudi Arabia and Israel as well, hoping to um, get us to, to back off, also launching chemical and biological warfare. Uh, the American general, and he is actually for the UN uh, uh, troops, uh, is Storm and Norman, Norman Schwarzkopf, who is focusing on pushing Iraq out. Uh, here you see the highway of death, as it was called, um, as people were fleeing after, uh, during this time. Uh, and the f area focus where this is all going on. Um, I'm sorry, one other thing to mention about this. Um, in February of, uh, February of 1991, uh, troops did invade for 100 hours, literally for four days, until finally a ceasefire was called. Um, so the majority of Operation Desert Storm is a bombing raid followed by some troops on the ground. Uh, but we were successful, at least at this time, of pushing Iraq out. Uh, other issues are obviously going to come up later on with um, 
Saddam Hussein that would have to be dealt with later on. Uh, this cartoon uh, is alluding to uh, George H.W. Bush. He very famously said in his 1988 campaign, read my lips, no new taxes. And then once he was in office, like many presidents have to do, ended up uh, raising taxes. And this is going to help be one of the downfalls of his reelection or lack of reelection in 1992.